The American Broadcasting Company Radio Network presents Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, commander-in-chief of the Space Patrol! <laughs> In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy have landed on a strange planet in a remote galaxy. In their space suits, they've boarded a stranded spaceship to rescue a fellow Space Patrol. Buzz carried the wounded pilot into the airlock. Open the outer hatch, Hap. Yes, sir. We'll be back in a moment with a thrilling story, Ambush in Space. Listen, kids, you know how much fun it is to be growing up. Every day there's a new thrill. Well, here's a thrill maybe you haven't tried yet, and believe me, you'll like it. It's the fun of having enough money to get the things you want. Maybe a new bike or a camera, or saving for something big like business school or college in the years to come. Sound good? Well, here's how you do it. Put a part of your allowance and the extra cash you earn each week into school savings. It doesn't take long to have enough to buy a real United States savings bond like Dad gets all the time. And bonds earn money for you. So start to save now. Have the money for the things you want when you want. Now today's Space Patrol adventure, Ambush in Space. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are in a remote galaxy searching for members of a space patrol expedition that had been set out to find the source of mysterious spacophone signals. Buzz and Happy rescued one of the pilots from an attack by the unfriendly forces that guard the galaxy. Three other pilots still are lost. Through the commander's strategy, the leader of the galactic defenses has agreed to a truce, during which Buzz and Happy will be permitted to find the remaining members of the expedition and return to the United Planets. Menacori aboard Terra 5 calling units of Expedition Enigma. Pilots are ordered to acknowledge immediately if able to do so. Urgent. Commander Corey calling Lieutenant Stitter. Lieutenant Marsden. And Lieutenant Beaker. It looks bad to me. Even if their minions could be used away, they, they should have picked up a hyperspace signal by now. One thing I'm really worried about, Hank. Those pilots went into Star Drive, I'll make a hell of a detective. Yeah. Their calculations would be way off. They not only did miss our solar system, but our entire galaxy. You've got to keep up the search, man. See how long Mako will keep his part of the body. I don't trust him either, Commander. Roughly on 15 degree heading. This is making allowance for aberration. Hey, listen, it's one of our men. Repeating, Lieutenant Marsden calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Corey here, Marsden. Can you read me? Yes, sir. Are you all right? I'm okay, Commander, but something's wrong with the ship. I'm grounded on a planet near a creamy star. Is your ship damaged? No, sir. It's the power control system. I've been trying to find the trouble so I can blast off. Happy's getting a directional fix on you now, Marsden. Even if you repair the ship, remain at your present location until I arrive. Very good, sir. When did you last hear from any of the others? Well, not for about 18 hours, sir. That's why I landed. I figured if all of us kept flying through space during that freak cosmic storm, we'd never contact each other again. That wasn't a cosmic storm, Marsden. It's part of the defenses of this galaxy. It's a deflecting field. It occurs electromagnetic waves, including light waves and space phone signals. No wonder we lost track of each other. Now listen, Marsden. This galaxy is controlled by a race of human beings that are highly developed scientifically. They also happen to be extremely suspicious of us because we're from another galaxy. You've had contact with them, then? Enough to make Happy and me realize that we're very unpopular. I promised their leader, Makor, that we'd get out of their galaxy as soon as I located the members of the expedition. Lieutenant Northfield has already returned to Terra. I see. I told Makor the truth, that our expedition came here to find out the source of those space phone signals. Well, we found it. So, since we aren't welcome in this galaxy, we'll go home. I've got a fix on Lieutenant Marsden. Good, Happy. Marsden, we'll land and see if we can repair your ship. If we can't, you'll come aboard Terra 5. Are you in any immediate danger? None that I know of. Frankly, I don't like the looks of this planet. Is it inhabited? I doubt it. It's got an atmosphere, but it's not fit to breathe. It's almost as hot as our planet Mercury. Frankly, I'll be glad to get off. You'll be there as soon as we can. Hurry out. On the key planet of the galaxy's defense system, Makor, the guardian of the Draxic star system, confers with his chief aide, Sindrana. I have good news for you, Sindrana. Our communications officers have solved the language pattern of the visitors. And Cory is still in the galaxy. Yes. He plans to rescue a pilot who, for some peculiar reason, 
chose to lend his ship on Kerba 3. Kerba 3? No one with any intelligence would go anywhere near the Kerba planetary system. Exactly. In fact, I'm beginning to understand why our altar ray failed to eliminate Cory in our recent encounter. The altar ray was designed to destroy beings of super intelligence. Cory is of a race of beings comparable to us. Then we have nothing to hear from him. Perhaps not from him personally. But remember, he has penetrated our galaxy. Others of his race may follow. Perhaps we should put on the reflector field again. No, no, not yet. It is a costly process. It seems likely now that Corey personally is anxious to find his men and return to his own galaxy. Oh, I might have been able to task force to find their way back here. Yes, although Corey has assured us that his united planets, as he calls them, have no desire for conquest, he is a stranger. It is not wise to trust a stranger. You are right, Sinvana. And that is why I want you to board your spaceship and bless off for Kerba 3. You are sending me alone? Yes. But this time there is no danger. You will attack Cory only when you are sure he is helpless. Now go on, Sinvana. Proceed to Kerba 3. Following Lieutenant Marsden's space upon signal, Buzz brings the terrified toward the greenish star that the inhabitants of the galaxy is known as Kerba. Although blasts of static obliterate Marsden's signal for long intervals, the space patrollers finally locate the planet where Marsden landed. It's certainly the most desperate looking planet I've seen. It's volcanic, apparently, and subject to electrical storms. Hey, Commander, it's got a moon, too. It just popped up over the horizon. Mm, Popped away. The size of it is simply close to the planet. It sure must be something to watch. I oh, wouldn't want to be there to watch it. Not on the surface of any way. Let's see if we can break through that electrical storm and contact Marsden. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Lieutenant Marsden. Marsden, can you read me? Lieutenant Marsden here, Commander. We're very weak. We're getting a lot of interference. Same at this end. Can you direct us to the ship? I'm not in the ship, sir. I thought I saw something moving a few hundred yards from the ship. I went out to investigate. Something moving? You mean alive? Well, I don't know. I don't see how anything could be alive on this planet. Maybe it was just rolling, blown by the wind or something. I never did catch it. I slipped the spell and hurt my leg. Can you make it back to the ship? I'm trying to, sir. But, Commander, can you see that balloon from where you are? Yes, it must look gigantic from the surface. Well, it certainly does. Its orbital velocity is terrific. I bet it's the moon that's causing those quakes. Quakes? Yeah, the ground shakes most of the time. Believe me, I'll be glad to get off this planet. Captain, have you been able to get any sort of fix in my uh, Yes, sir. It's a rough one, but when we get closer, I think we'll be able to see the ship. This will help any commander. The ship's in a sort of white gully or a beam. Okay, Martin, just keep talking. We'll come in on your signal. Chief Aid, Sindrana calling His Excellency, Makor, Guardian of the Galaxy. Sindrana calling Makor. This is Makor. I made to make his from Herbert V, Excellency, where he's about to land. When he does, I'll be ready to attack. No, no, wait. It may not be necessary. Kerba 3 is not a hospitable planet. Even if the quakes and volcanoes will destroy the visitors, there are still the corrosive chemicals. Then you want me to withhold my attack until Corey is about to blast off, if he does? Yes. Uh, the men already on the planet is called Marsden. Corey plans to repair Marsden's ship. Every second they are on the planet increases their chances of being destroyed. You're right, Nathan. Kerber 3 has its own methods of getting good. I see Marsden ship in it. It's just about a mile up the ravine from the lake. Let's have your leg. Marsden! Lieutenant Marsden, can you read me? My leg. My leg. Are you all right? <sighs> oh, hold on, Marsden. We're very close. We've sighted the ship. Can you see us? Marsden, answer me. Did you reach the ship? Marsden! Captain, something's happened to Marsden. I'm going to have to work fast. It's not like the looks of that lake. It seems to be spilling over into the ravine. I never saw water that color anywhere. But it doesn't look too serious. I think it's a slight thicker. I know, but the quakes and tidal pull of that moon, there's no telling what'll happen. They set our ship down on higher ground than Marsden. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. And still be close. There's a slight hump of rock a few hundred yards away from the cruiser. I'll land there. Get our space on top of the locker. After landing the Terra 5, Buzz and Happy make their way toward Marsden's cruiser, their space boots slipping on the hard, rough surface of the planet. Wow. No wonder Marsden was great. But the point like I said, it looks like I just did, and then twisted it. Yeah. What your face looks like. Commander, you don't know. Very happy. If he made it into the ship, he might have a chance. We'll check his ship first. He'd think it there if he could. Commander, you were right about that lake overflowing. See, it, it's trickling along the bottom of the river. It looks like water. It looks so thick and, and heavy. Not water, Hap. 
to get the Mars' ship. Yes, sir. Find a narrow spot, leave the cross, Captain. We can go right up the Mars' ship. Okay, Captain, right here. Jump across. <laughs> That's it, Hap. Here I come. <laughs> now, let's get up. Oh, hey, excuse me, sir. I dropped some of my ray gun. It, it bounced out of my home. Uh, there it is. It fell into the stream. <laughs> it's floating like a cork on water. Liquid must be heavier than ordinary metal. Now, that's a break. If the gun sank, I'd have to plunge my space suit glove under the liquid. But don't touch it, Hap. It don't dissolve. My ray gun dissolved. We'll be back to Space Patrol in just a moment. Boys and girls, here's a little problem. How long does it take to cross a street? Five seconds? Ten seconds? Well, that may be the right answer. If you're careful to cross at the corner and wait for the traffic light. But if you cross in the middle of the block, it may take weeks to get to the other side. Yes, weeks. Weeks spent in the hospital or in bed at home with the broken bones and bruises that come from being in an automobile accident. Don't forget... The motorist doesn't expect to find anyone in the middle of the block. He may not be able to stop in time. That's why it may take weeks from the moment you start across the street until you finally reach the other side. The second you might save isn't worth those weeks you might lose. So be careful. Cross with the light and only at corners. Remember the life you save may be your own. Now back to today's thrilling Space Patrol adventure, Ambush in Space. Buzz and Happy have landed on the planet Kerba 3 to rescue Lieutenant Marston, whose space patrol cruiser is unable to blast off. The planet is rocky, desolate, and with a poisonous atmosphere. Continuing fates have caused the nearby lake to spill a strange metallic fluid down into the ravine where the helpless ship is resting. Finding Lieutenant Marston unconscious inside his ship, Buzz and Happy, clad in spacesuits, are about to step from the airlock when they notice that the liquid metal is rising around the ship and is dissolving the ladder. Ladder. Now it's eating away at the other part of the ship. We can only blast off before the ship is completely melted Mars down. Mars spent hours trying to fix this map. We've only got a few minutes. Oh, wait. The rocket won't work, but Mars can see anything about the repeller ray. The repeller ray? Right now. I'll stay here in the airlock of Mars. If you walk forward, cut on the repeller ray. Right, Commander. Can you hear me, Hap? Yes, sir. You have to advance the power slowly until I tell you to stop. Yes, sir. Now, 
Sir, I've got him, sir. Come on. Let's get going, sir. Several miles above the surface of the planet Turba 3, Sindrana observes the scene below the Obusco, then reports to the Guardian of the Galaxy. One of their ships has already been engulfed by the corrosive liquid metal. Well, uh, what about Corey? Was he in the ship that was destroyed? I can't tell from this distance. Should I drop lower and investigate? No, uh, I don't think that will be necessary. Wait until the other ship is involved. Then we'll know our intruder... Make off! Something's gone wrong. What do you mean? The other ship has blasted off. What? In my view scope, I can see Corey's ship moving, rising into space. Then get away from Turbo Tree quickly before he sees you. Perhaps I, I could destroy him now. He probably won't be expecting us. No, no. I have another idea. I'm changing our strategy. We will cooperate with our visitors. Cooperate? Yes. But they don't trust us. I know that. But once we gain their confidence and trust, it will be different. For the time being, the planner. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling units of Expedition Enigma. Commander Corey calling Lieutenant Spitter and Lieutenant Beaker. Any contact yet, Commander? No. Not with him at last. Okay, sir. He wants to come up forward and help us find the other planets. Just hope Beaker and Spitter haven't run into any more planets at that time. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5, calling units of Expedition Enigma. Commander Corey calling... Expedition Enigma, unit 3 to Commander Corey. Lieutenant Beaker here. A break at last. Beaker, are you all right? Yes, sir. Except that I've lost track of all the others, I've had no contact for 20 hours. Captain Northfield has returned to Terra. Lieutenant Marsden is aboard Terra 5 with me. Now that we've contacted you, only Stitter is missing. How are your instruments? Is your hyperspace vector computer working? I can't say for sure, sir. I ran into some sort of disturbance shortly after the expedition arrived in this galaxy. Frankly, I'm not sure of anything now. You'll join ships, and I'll come aboard and check your computer against the one in Terra 5. Then we'll be sure you can get back to Terra okay. Yes, sir. I'm changing vector now and heading toward you. Well, incidentally, a while ago, I picked up something in my view school. I thought it might be a spaceship, but it disappeared before I could check. It's probably one of the galaxy ships, Beaker. They're very suspicious of strangers, so avoid all contact. Very good, Commander. Judging by our fix on your space phone signal, we're on an approach vector. Turn your ID signal on. All right, Commander. Coming in okay, Beaker. Steady as you go. Hurry out. All right, have to take over the control. I'm going back to help the Yes, sir. In the headquarters of the Guardian of the Black Sox Galaxy, Makor intently watches a gigantic viewscope screen upon which two tiny dots are slowly converging toward the center. With a smile of grim satisfaction, he clicks on a spacephone transmitter. Ah, uh, good fortune is with us, Sindrana. Hori has contacted one of the other pilots. The two ships are now approaching Turba and Zankoa. Turba and Zankoa? Hmm. Are any of our ships here? No, not within a million Domegas. Corey and the other pilot are now about 10,000 Omegas apart. Uh, possibly stop either ship now. I didn't tell you all I know. Between Corey and the other ship is the magnetic vortex. They're both heading right toward it. They'll be destroyed. They'll be caught in it before they know anything's wrong. Their ship will be twisted, ripped to pieces by the vortex. Not quite. Only Corey's ship will be destroyed. Then, using the translator here at headquarters, I will warn the other pilot. Hmm. We can capture him and take over his star drive. Exactly. There is nothing to do now but watch the screen and wait until the phone is stopped. I need to pick up Lieutenant Beaker on the view scope, Commander. Maybe we can tell how far away he is. But his ID signal, we at least know his direction. Uh, if there are only some planets fairly close to us, we could relay some astrogation coordinates to Beaker. That meteor might help us. 
That little thing? It's several hundred times bigger than a spaceship. It's almost in the same heading we are. If Beaker can pick it up in his district, it'd be simple to figure how far apart they are. Sure, he could see that meteor long before he could see our ship. We'll figure its velocity and direction, then contact Beaker. Yes, sir. The meteor isn't as good a guide as a planet, but oh, that's better than nothing. Well, that's funny. What's the trouble? Well, the meteor, sir, seems to be in a, in a regular vector. I see what you mean, huh? Behaving as though it were being guided. Suddenly pulled by a huge object in space. But there isn't any such object. Still, something's affecting that meteor. Next, it'll be affecting us. Commander, am I nuts? Or did that meteor fly apart? It certainly did happen. It's completely disintegrated. If we don't change our vector, the same thing will happen to us. The meteor deflected the starboard half, so we'll build sharply to port. Yes, sir. Uh, how about Lieutenant Beaker? I'll warn him now. Minna Corey aboard, terrified, calling Lieutenant Beaker. Urgent. Corey to Lieutenant Beaker. Uh, Lieutenant Beaker here, sir. Beaker, we're both heading towards some powerful, invisible force. It just deflected a meteor and exploded it. Cut your velocity and set a course 90 degrees to your present vector. Yes, sir. Have you picked this up in your view scope yet? No, Commander. Well, how about a meteor, roughly on our own heading? I've seen nothing in the view scope, Commander. And you're probably farther from this course than we are. Keep your ID signal on. Happen I'll try to work out an astrogation chart on distant stars. When we get one that looks practical, we'll contact you. I get it. We'll try meeting a few million TUs out in space, away from this force you mentioned. Right, Beaker. And since we don't know the extent of that force, the farther away, the better. I'll contact you in a few minutes. Corey out. Now, have it. We'll pick a star pattern and relay the data to Beaker. Beaker can detect the same pattern from his present position. We'll know we've got a good record. This is Maycor calling Commander Corey. Commander, it's Maycor. He's got his translator working. Corey here. Go ahead, Maycor. Commander, you are in no danger if you follow my instructions. I'll be glad to help you. Oh, then you know what happened, or, or nearly happened to us. Yes. I heard your conversation with Lieutenant Beaker. You are in the region of what we call the magnetic vortex. For centuries, our own ships have avoided that part of space. If you will follow my directions, I'll help you to join Lieutenant Beaker. Where are you now? I'm at my headquarters on a distant planet. I'm observing your ship on an ultra-powerful and you've plotted the boundaries of this, uh, this magnetic vortex. Yes, Commander. Considering the way you feel about strangers in your galaxy, you're being extremely cooperative. Well, I... I realize now that you are keeping your part of your part, and that your only desire is to return to your own solar system. Now, if you will maneuver your ship tonight, thank you. Perhaps, according to Mako, if we hold this heading, we'll miss the vortex. Commander, do you think he's on the level? I don't know. The trouble is, there's no way we can find out. If he's deliberately heading us into the vortex, we won't know it until our ship starts to come apart. Wait, now. There is a way. If we were to fire a space torpedo directly ahead of us, what would happen? Well, the torpedo would keep accelerating ahead of us farther and farther. Right. As long as the torpedo didn't change course, we'd know we were in a safe vector. And if it did change... We could have at least a few seconds to act. Tap a line of torpedo to fire on a zero-degree heading. Yes, sir. I'll contact Lieutenant Beaker and see if he's had any luck with an astrogation data. Manicori aboard terrified, calling Lieutenant Beaker. Beaker here, sir. Did you locate that constellation from the data? Yes, sir. All points checked to less than one degree parallax. When you were talking to that, that Maycor, I got a space phone fixed on both of you. That data reconciles the parallax, Commander. I'd say my instruments are okay. In that case, Lieutenant, you can set your hyperspace vector and return to Terra immediately. I'll continue the search for Spitter. Very well, Commander. Good luck, Beaker. Hurry out. Computer trajectory all set, Commander. Very good, happen. Fire. Well, there goes our guiding star, our life insurance. All we've got to do is keep it in the view scope. As long as it stays on a steady course, we know we're safe. Hey, when can we be sure that we're completely away from the vortex here? When we get near a planetary system. Or if we see another ship, one from this galaxy. Ah, look at that torpedo. Changing course. Oh, yeah, I'll say. It's bearing to port. Make more light. We've got to change course quick. Commander, that torpedo, it acts like it's gone crazy. Fire starboard rockets. I'll set a course 90 degrees to our previous vector. The torpedo exploded. Did you see that flash? Yes, sir. Plunged into the vortex. Ah, that's what we'd have done if you hadn't changed course. Sir, do you think we're safe now? Will we miss that force field? Party and vapor calling Commander Corey. Corey here. Are we on the right vector, Maycor? Commander, this is urgent. My new spoke screen shows that you have changed course. You must follow instructions exactly, or you will meet with disaster. Now, quick, before it's late, return to your previous course. Nice try, Maycor, but we're on to you. Why, I, sir. What do you mean? You'd try to run us right into that vortex. It just causes a space torpedo to find out that you can't be trusted. What? You invader? All right. You avoided the vortex. And 
Now, I'm going after you personally, Corey. I'll get you. When I do, you will regret that you ever entered this galaxy. I'd be more impressed with your threat, Makor, if you had a reputation for keeping your word. Hey, that's telling him, Commander. Now listen, Makor. One of my men is still lost in your galaxy. I intend to find him and take him home. Whenever or wherever you try to stop me, I'll be ready. A preview of next week's Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Young men between the ages of 17 and 18 and a half with a military obligation, the National Guard offers many advantages and opportunities. You can earn new skills, earn extra income, and gain experience and leadership. You can learn to become a pilot and qualify for a commission. And there are retirement benefits, too. If you enlist in your local National Guard unit, you may start your training right there at home. There is no need to interrupt your work or school. Inquire about the unlimited opportunities the National Guard offers you by contacting your local armory. Preparedness now is a safeguard against the future. Do your part by enlisting in the National Guard. Now a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in their spaceship, approaching a planet in a remote solar system. Commander, where did that thing come from? It's a glowing object. It's headed right towards us. A meteor. Meteors don't glow in empty space. It's getting brighter. It's a ball of fire. There's another one. Where in the universe are they coming from? It's a weapon, Hap. A weapon? And it's some sort of... It's got to be maker's work, right? It's trying to make good his threat to destroy it. Be with us next week for the thrilling Space Patrol story, The Prison Planet. Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Helen Moser. Other players were Bela Kovac, Norm Jolly, and Ken Mayer. Lee Zimmer speaking. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facility.